Happy Sabbath. We're coming to you from the Middletown Seventh-day Adventist Church here on a very crisp Sabbath morning. I think it's about 20 degrees out. The sun is out. And we're at lesson six in our quarterly lesson on Isaiah. And our memory text is from Isaiah 25, verse 9. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The opening paragraph on Saturday uh, has a very interesting, funny little illustration I'd like to begin. After a minister had preached a searching sermon on pride, a woman who had heard the sermon waited for him and told him that she was in much distress of mind, that she would like to confess a great sin. The minister asked her what the sin was. She answered, quote, the sin of pride, for I sat for an hour before my mirror some days ago, admiring my beauty. Oh, responded the minister, that was not a sin of pride, that was a sin of imagination. Ever since, sin was born in the heart of a mighty angel. Pride has not respected the boundaries of reality in angels or in people. Nowhere is this problem seen worse than those who harbor spiritual pride. Let's take a look at the origin of pride and self-exaltation. You know, the two great um, competing traits that are fought over throughout the Bible and through each one of us is the battle between pride and the battle between humility. Spiritual pride and spiritual humility. One writer said, humility is the root of every virtue, while pride is the root of every sin. And we know that it goes back even before the beginning in heaven with Lucifer and his pride. And we're going to talk about that here later. Let's go to Sunday's lesson. Doom on the nations. Doom on the nations. And this lesson study is going to look at Israel, the nation of Israel. The northern, but particularly where Isaiah was from, the southern kingdom, Judah. And how pagan nations were going to carry out judgment. God's judgment. We know that because God chose Nebuchadnezzar as his instrument of righteousness and judgment on the fallen southern kingdom. He also used the Assyrian king, several Assyrian kings, to bring judgment upon the northern kingdom Israel. And this happened about a hundred years before the fall of Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. So God can use pagan kings and pagan nations to carry out his will. And that is what, hap what is happening here. If you'll turn to Isaiah 13, and I particularly want to look at verses three through five. This is a prophecy against the nations that begins with Babylon. And so Babylon is going to be judged by the Medes and the Persians, just as God used Babylon to judge the southern kingdom of Judah. Verses 3, 4, and 5. I have commanded my consecrated ones. I even called my mighty warriors, my proudly exalting ones, to execute my anger. A sound of tumult on the mountains, like that of many people, a sound of the uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts is mustering an army for battle. They are coming from a far country, from the farthest horizons. The Lord and his instruments of indignation to destroy the whole land. Now, of course, this is the oracle against Babylon. 
And as we continue with it, if we go down to verse 17 through 22, it continues how God is going to raise up the Medes and also the Persians to bring down the greatest empire the world had seen at that time. Again, Isaiah 13, verses 17 through 22. Behold, I am going to stir up the Medes against them. Who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold? And their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb. Nor will their children, will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there. But desert creatures will lie down there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches also will live there, and shaggy goats will frolic there. Hyenas will howl in their fortified towers, jackals in their luxurious palaces. Her fateful time also will come, and her days will not be prolonged. Basically, Babylon is going to be wiped off the map. It would never be the great kingdom it was before. <clears throat> Even today, when Saddam Hussein, a number of years back, was saying, I'm going to recreate Babylon Believers in biblical prophecy knew that would never happen, and it's not. It's basically a haunt of jackals, of basically nomads, who are nomadic Arab tribes who pass through there. That's all Babylon is. It's like it had not existed before, but we have the books of the Bible that tell us there once was a great kingdom. There once was a head of gold. There once was a great king called Nebuchadnezzar and then Xerxes and others who followed him. But that would take the place of the Mede and Persian Empire, which would then come the Greek Empire, which would then come the Roman Empire. So the Lord has first chosen them, the Medes and the Persians, as his instrument of judgment against Babylon. The Lord will use the means to conquer Babylon. It will never be inhabited again. Now, of course, the great power in Isaiah's time was Assyria. Assyria was a threat to the northern kingdom, which had its capital in Samaria. It was made up of tribes, let's say, of Ephraim, of Manasseh, of Naphtali, of Issachar. Basically, 10 out of the 12 tribes, Zebulun, many of them there. Ephraim was the key northern tribe, Dan. Ten of the twelve were conquered by Assyria. And the third paragraph on Sunday's lesson says, During much of Isaiah's ministry, Assyria dominated Babylon. From 728 B.C. when Tiglath Pileser III took Babylon and was proclaimed king of Babylon under the throne name, Assyrian kings retook Babylon several times. Babylon, however, eventually would become the great superpower in the region, the power that would destroy the Judean kingdom. And so as we, as we look at this, for basically from about the early 700 B.C. to first when Assyria conquered Babylon, which was not the great kingdom it would become, and then it's expanding Outward, it's going towards Syria, as Syria is. And then it's coming into the northern kingdom. And of course, if you read the, the book of Amos, Amos is dealing with that throughout his book because he was up there in the northern kingdom. But now Isaiah is looking way down through history because when this prophecy came to Isaiah, Babylon was not the great kingdom it would begin. That's why prophecy, he can look past the hundred 150 years when Babylon would rule the world. Because at this time of Isaiah's writing, Assyria is the key. Let's turn to Monday's lesson, the late great city of Babylon. 
<clears throat> in 626 BC, the Chaldean Nabopolassar restored Babylonian glory by making himself king in Babylon, beginning the Neo-Babylonian dynasty and participating with Medea in the defeat of Assyria. His son, Nebuchadnezzar II, was the king who conquered and exiled Judah. So right around 626 BC, when Nabopolassar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's father, and he defeats Assyria, as Assyria had defeated Babylon about 100 years before. Now Babylon becomes the key power in that region. In fact, it did in 605 with the key battle where they defeated the Egyptian uh, empire at the Battle of Carchemish. And then right in 605 BC, there you have Nebuchadnezzar doing the first exile of certain Jews from Jerusalem. Daniel and his three friends were a part of that first exile. The second exile came in 597 BC, where we know the prophet Ezekiel went in that. And then the final one, 586, when the temple was burnt, the city was razed to the ground. And then the third and final biggest exile went from Jerusalem and the southern kingdom all the way to Babylon in captivity. Those who were left, and there were those who were left, uh, intermarried with the people of the territory, with the Canaanites. Some of them became the descendants of what we now know today as the Samaritan people up in the northern part of the northern kingdom of Israel. And of course, then you had the Samaritans. They had the Samaritan Bible, which had just the first five books of the Bible, Torah, that were the five books that they followed. How did the city of Babylon finally end? Let's look at Isaiah 14, verses 1 through 2. When the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel and settle them in their own land, then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. The peoples will take them along and bring them to their place and the house of Israel will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord as male servants and female servants and they will take their captors captive and will rule over their oppressors. And of course, one of the things as we look at is that God had a chosen instrument in King Cyrus of Persia Cyrus would be his instrument in overthrowing Babylon in 539 BC when Cyrus went underneath the town through the aqueducts through the uh, through the through the uh, un underneath where where the water was and they caught Babylon on that night completely unawares in fact if you want to keep your place Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, verses 5, 1 through 2. Oh, sorry. Daniel 5, beginning in verse 1. And this is the last night of Babylon. So for those of you here, we're looking at Daniel chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The fall of the great city of Babylon. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. And he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. 
They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. The king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. <clears throat> Belshazzar, who was two generations from the great King Nebuchadnezzar, asked at a drunken banquet to bring forward the religious items, the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple of Jerusalem out of the Lord's house. So they could drink them and they could toast that our gods were greater than the God of the Jews. And they drank. They praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And that's when the hand, the writing on the wall, happened. And it was written there. Do you remember what, what, what did the writing on the wall say? You have been found wanting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting, and your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. And that night, and that night, that was the end of the empire because it says that same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So the downfall of the late great city of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, here on Monday's lesson, the third paragraph in the middle. Well, let's just do the third paragraph at the beginning. Alexander the Great took Babylon from the Persians in 331 BC without a fight. In spite of his short-lived dream to make Babylon his eastern capital, the city declined over seven centuries. By AD 98, the Roman Septimus Severus found Babylon completely deserted. So the great city came to an end through abandonment. Today, some Iraqi villagers live on parts of the ancient site, but they have not rebuilt the city as such. And so that prophecy given in Isaiah 13 about Babylon is still true today. It has not been rebuilt. Nomadic tribes can go by. I would assume they probably have a plaque there, if I had to guess. Here was the site of the great kingdom, the kingdom that ruled all of the Middle East, great world kingdom at that time, but now it is no more. But now it is no more. And so now we have, on Tuesday's lesson, the fall of the mountain king. And this is talking about the king of Babylon. And of course, this is looking at it in a dual way, not only the king of Babylon, but what spiritual pride represents, going back to Lucifer up in heaven. So let's look at Isaiah 14. Let's read, we'll go through the first seven verses. When the Lord will have compassion on Jacob, and again, choose Israel, and then settle them in their own land, then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. The peoples will take them along and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord, as male servants and female servants, and they will take their captors captive and will rule over their oppressors. It will be in that day when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved, that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say, how the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. 
The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the peoples in fury with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger and with unrestrained persecution. The whole earth is at rest and is at quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. The whole earth rejoices with the fall of Babylon. All the peoples that had been conquered. All their riches, all their great palaces are now on the decline and soon they will be no more. In fact, you can see some of, some of the lions on walls of the palaces in Berlin, Germany. I actually went there. And you can see it up on a wall. It's like the lion, which was the lion of symbol of Babylon. You can see that um, in the museum there. But that's about all it is. People can come, they can study it, but it's no more. There's no city of Babylon. They probably have a few plaques. You'll have a few nomadic Arab tribes going through. But, yeah, it is no more. It's, it's basically out in the desert, and I'm sure many people go there to look at it. But it's like going to look at a grave. That's all it is. It's all it is. In fact, um, Dave Kent, are, are you, are you who, who's in uh, Isaiah chapter 14? Okay, Chris, <clears throat> I, need your, I need your preaching voice now. Could you read Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14? This is talking about the king of Babylon, but it's talking about the real power behind the king of Babylon. Go right ahead. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Okay, what word is used over and over again? He's got a bad case of the eyes. I did this. I did that. You can always tell uh, people that have pride. They use I a lot. They don't use I if there's a problem. It's you. You're right. They don't say, well, I caused that. I'm going to take. No, I didn't do it. You did. But I did this. I did that. I, and of course, this is Lucifer, the covering angel up in heaven before creation. And of course, we know from Revelation 12, verses 1 through 9, war fell up, war became in heaven. As Lucifer tried to usurp Jesus' place as basically number two to God. And he was cast down to heaven. How many of the angels went with him? He took a third. He took a third with him. And they're here. And of course, he was there in the Garden of Eden. And that's where we're at today. Pride. The first murder. What caused the first murder? Pride. Pride. His pride was hurt. Little brother's sacrifice was accepted. Cain's was not. His pride was hurt. He was embarrassed. And that led to the first murder. Pride. Pride is the root of every sin. Humility is the root of every virtue. This is really what the great controversy is about here. And we see this here in these verses. Verse 13, you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God and I will sit in the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So, in fact, 
in Ezekiel, verses 28, Ezekiel 28, verses 14 through 16, we get another view of this. This is dealing with the king of Tyre, but we know who is speaking this. It's the same power behind the king of Babylon was behind the king of Tyre. Um, do you have that, Peggy? Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16. Anyone has that? If you want to. Through 16. Thou art the anointed chair of the covereth, and I have set thee so that set that set thee so thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stone of fire. <coughs> thou was perfect in the way from the day that thou was, was created till iniquity was found in thee by the multi multitude of the merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned therefore I will cast thee as prone out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee O, come, o covered chair from the midst of the stone of fire okay so he's basically number three in the kingdom. He was the anointed cherub. It talks about he was beautiful, but he was jealous of Christ. He wanted to be sitting next to the Father right there in the assembly of God. And that wasn't going to happen. That wasn't going to happen. And so, again, Lucifer's down here on earth, and he's working, isn't he? 24 7 he's a hard worker he puts in the he puts in the hours that's right he's not lazy if, if only he were because he wants to make sure he wants to take as many people with him with him into the lake of fire and that will help his pride look how many people I took with me I mean, he took a third of the angels. These, these were perfect beings, right? They were created perfect. Adam and Eve, they were created perfect. So, I mean, we're fallen. You know, we get old. And we die. That's, that's a result of sin. Um, one, two, the third paragraph on Tuesday's lesson. As in Isaiah 14, <clears throat> Ezekiel 28 identifies heaven daring arrogance with the ruler of a city. Here also the description goes beyond that of an earthly monarch and God's crosshairs come into sharper focus. The proud potentate was in the Garden of Eden, an anointed covering or guardian cherub on God's holy mountain, perfect from the day he was created until sin was found in him cast out by God, and will eventually be destroyed with fire. Applied to any human being, the specific terms of this rhetoric are so figurative as to be meaningless. But Revelation 12, 7 through 9, does tell of a mighty being who was cast out of heaven with his angels, Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, who deceived Eve in Eden. So again, pride. The fall of pride. Before pride cometh the fall, right? Before pride cometh the fall. If we look down at the box, what is the opposite of this? What is the opposite of Lucifer there in Isaiah 14 and also in Ezekiel 18? If you'll go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, we have the exact opposite of spiritual pride. The exact opposite. It says, and we think this is one of the earliest hymns that Paul wrote to describe Christ. Have this attitude in yourselves, 
which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And then let me just read nine. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. So here we have the opposite. Lucifer wanted to ascend. Said, I want to ascend to be the most high. He wanted to go up. Here in Paul, Christ already was the most high. He went down, right? He, he descended. You have the descent. He gave up some of his divine attributes to come down here where he would have fear, anxiety. The sweat would pour off him like blood. Disappointment. All kinds of things you and I have to share. He emptied himself and he came all the way down here to live with us not as a king, but as a poor little baby in a poor family. Yes, Chris? Ellen White writes that even um, Satan, as he looked upon Jesus as a baby, marveled at how Jesus brought himself down this low to meet us. Yes. Even Satan marveled. And that was, Satan was smart enough, he knew this was a problem. It would have been better if he just came down and said, I am king, you're going to all listen to me, you're going to bring me all kinds of treasures and that, and if you don't do it right, boom, you're out of here. But he didn't. He came down, he died the most humiliating death, the death on the cross, and then because of that, because of the descent, because of the humility, because of the humiliating death, descent, humiliation, he now ascended back on high, Exalted by everyone. So basically the way to exaltation goes from the descent, hum humility, sometimes humiliation, and then comes the exaltation. That's the way it goes. Satan did not want that. Most of us don't want that either. Most of us do not want that either. And it depends how we deal with it. Most of us, you know, I don't, you know, hey, drop me down as far as I can go. Hey, humiliation, more, and even the better and that. And it just shows what Christ had to undergo so that you and I could have the gift of salvation for him. He totally rejected the prideful model. And we know that because we cannot say, through my own deeds, I am saved. We can't. That's Satan, right? Through, now Christ in me, working in me, burying the old man of sin and death, can do great things. I won't be perfect. I'm not going to be perfect till I get a new perfect body at the resurrection. But he can work great things. He can change us. Because he needs us to be his witnesses to other imperfect people. And so when you witness to someone... You put the pride away saying, oh yeah, I, uh, I no longer hit the bottle like I did, like you did, pal. I did it on my own. I'm tough. No. That's not going to get your friend off the bottle. That's not. There is a greater power. That, that, that's why probably the best self-help group ever was Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, because they said there is, there's a, only a higher power that can get me through this. And when you have to go in, in there and stand in front of everyone and said, you know, my name is Fred, I'm an alcoholic. You know, basically, it's not like, hey, I'm, I, I've made it. There's the humility. <laughs> and you do that because there might be someone out there. This is their first meeting. And they need that. And that's why then you'll have a buddy. You'll have someone that, hey, I fell, I took a drink, you know, and then you're there. You see, if it was based on you got to get tough, you, you know, only the tough overcome this disease, it wouldn't work. 
But when you come up and say my name is, you know, I'm a judge or I'm a congressman. Oh, and by the way, I'm also an alcoholic. That's that, that, that's how it works. Um, uh, my, my dad, who was on the bench, uh, he had a close friend. I'm not going to say who it was or whatever. Um, th this, this person was also on the bench. And he was a recovering alcoholic. And he, he, he never talked about it, but Dad said, I always knew where he was every Thursday night. He was at the meetings. And he had been dry for 20, 25 years. He found Christ. He was an elder in his church. But he, my dad said, after he died, he said, I always knew where he would be every Thursday night. Don't call. He would be there. And because helping others strengthens your own, your own walk. And again, it's based on humility and belief in a higher power. Uh, Wednesday's lesson, Heaven's Gate. <clears throat> Heaven's Gate. In Isaiah 14... A taunt against Satan, the fallen day star, the son of dawn, is blended into a taunt against the king of Babylon. Why? Compare Revelation 12, 1 through 9, where a dragon, identified as Satan, tries to destroy a child as soon as it is born. In Revelation 12, 5, the child clearly is Christ, but it was King Herod who tried to kill Jesus as a young child. The dragon is both Satan and the Roman power represented by Herod, because Satan works through human agents. Similarly, Satan was the power behind the king of Babylon and the prince of Tyre. And of course, after pagan Rome fell, you had the second phase of Roman rule. What phase was that? Not pagan Rome, papal Rome, the medieval, cat, the, the medieval church where where you had indulgences you had prayers to dead people and that you have the changing of the ten commandments uh, you you had you had all of that and so you have a mixture of political and religious power that's why it's always dangerous when churches get too deep into politics it never goes well if you can stand for key issues we need to do that I mean, the civil rights movement was the backbone was the Christian church. But you don't want to begin getting mixed up because once you do that, you're acting. You get, you get pride. I always say, whenever you see a pastor in his office and the most prominent picture he has is of a politician shaking his hands, he should hand in his credentials right then. He just become a precinct captain for that party or for that person. Nothing wrong with knowing, nothing wrong with that. But I'm saying, when they have those pictures in there, that's to impress. And that's the spirit of Lucifer. Even if this man whose hand you're shaking is a good person or a woman, it means you have now thrown your lot in with a certain party or a certain person. And it's going to dilute your, it's going to dilute your message. Half the people will love it. The other half will just, when you speak. And that's the problem. And again, it goes back to, to Lucifer with spiritual pride. Um, let's look up 1 Timothy 5.13. And this is... Uh, Peter is doing some farewells at the end of 1 Peter. He says, um, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Now, when this was written, we think probably around maybe in the 60 AD or something, was Babylon existing then? Now, so what does Babylon refer to here? Probably first off here refers to pagan Rome at this time. I mean, pagan Rome is what killed Paul and crucified Peter. So at this time, Peter is looking at pagan Rome, the Roman Empire. Then after that, though, uh, let's look in Revelation 16, 19. 
Revelation 16, 19. And this is, of course, looking into the future. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of her fierce wrath. And then to stay right there, Revelation 17, 5, and on her forehead a name was written, a mystery. <clears throat> Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So what is Babylon now in that pointing to? It's pointing to a kind of a religious political system Shows, show, sows confusion and because the empire of Babylon has gone. It's dealing with confusion. It's dealing with religious institutions, putting the Bible aside, putting human traditions in its place and having them worship human beings than God. And so in Peter's time when you said Babylon, it meant pagan Rome, now it could refer not only, not only to papal Rome, but to all the organizations that mix truth and error. That is the supreme example, but it's, you know, confusion. I mean, if we begin doing that here, hey, guess what? I'm acting like Babylon. It's that simple. It's that simple. And so it is confusion. Um, the last paragraph before the green block says the gate of heaven at Bethel and the gate of gods at Babylon that's where that was it was a gate I was mentioning in German in the German museum it was the gate of Babylon of Marduk which was there um, now getting back and the gate of the gods at Babylon were opposite ways to reach the divine realm Jacob's ladder originated in heaven Revealed from above by God. But Babylon, with its towers and ziggurat temples, was built by human beings from the ground up. These opposite ways represent contrasting paths to salvation. Divinely initiated grace versus human works. All true religion is based on the humble Bethel model. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Romans 2, 8 and 9. I mean, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. All false religion, including legalism and secular humanism, is based on the proud Babylon model. Two ways. Two ways. And so while the empire of Babylon is gone, its ideas still reign because Satan was behind it. He's still behind here. Um, I remember one pastor pretty famous evangelist, he came to speak at Andrews when I was there. We'd get all the big, you know, they'd all come through and they'd speak at Wednesday Chapel, uh, to, you know, to all of us aspiring pastors. And I remember that this one, he was, he was dealing with works and human pride. And he, and he said, I remember I was in this church and this guy came in on Sabbath morning. He was so happy. He said, I haven't sinned in a whole week. That guy just sinned, didn't he? Correct? Even if he did, and we don't know, Mrs. White said, there might be someone in this fallen noon body that could get pretty close, but that person would be the most humble. The most humble, the last one who would brag, because that's only who will get the closest to God. And I'm sure this guy, I haven't sinned in a whole week. Good luck on that, pal. Because mainly it's not through actions, it's through the mind. That's what Jesus talks about in Sermon on the Mount. Most of us are not going to kill people. Most of us, most people do not go out and break the Ten Commandments. They don't. And that's where spiritual pride can come. I mean, the toughest one is the tenth one, coveting, because that's dealing with the mind, your motives. We all covet something. But most people do not kill. They don't commit adultery. They honor their mother and their father, they worship God. It's the motives. It's the motives that can become corrupted. I can give $2 million to 
to a children's cancer hospital, which was badly needed. That's good. But if I say I'm going to give it on one condition, that you name the building after me, and you see this all the time, right? Now, in the end, it will be used for a good purpose, but you've just spoiled the whole thing because you want everyone to see what a good Samaritan you are. It's better the other, the other person that gives the money and says, I don't want any credit. I don't want people to know about it. Just go do, do its work. Thursday's lesson as we're wrapping up. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 24, verses 17 through 23. Olivera, could you read that, please? Um, Isaiah 24, verses 17 through 23, if you have that. And this is dealing with the fate of the inhabitants of the earth on the day of the Lord, when there comes judgment on Satan and his minions. Go right ahead, Olivera. Do you have that? Uh, Isaiah 24, verses 17 through 23. Okay. I will make justice the measuring line and the righteousness the corner. They have will sweep away. Now, is that, is that Isaiah 24? Oh, 24 and 28. Yeah. Those are good verses, too. Probably better verses than these, but this, this is dealing with the judgment. Thank you. In Isaiah's time, this is the messianic age. God will have judgment on the nations. He will reign on Mount Zion and his people with him. As Christians, this will happen at the second coming. When his people will be there, and then again after the thousand years when we come back to this earth. That will also be a fulfillment of this prophecy. So in the end, it is humility, not pride, that gets us closest to Jesus and allows us to witness for other peoples. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this very cold but sunny Sabbath morning that we're able to come here and study your word as we look on the humility of Christ, the opposite of, Luth of Lucifer. He descended, not ascended. He did it for us, and because of his great sacrifice of humility, he is now exalted at the right hand of God, and he will be coming home and taking his people to be with him very soon. Be with us and bless us at this time. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.